and welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast, Reimagining Business Strategies to Architect the Future of the Event Industry with Kim Meyer. Kim Meyer is the founder and managing partner of Experience Design. And in this episode, we talk about the need for redesigning experiences in a human-centered approach, the challenge of changing an industry that aims to be just flawless, how a bad speaker experience makes it hard for speakers to deliver compelling sessions at virtual events. We talk about how the event industry is learning a lot from TV broadcasting. We also talk about how event companies should focus on the benefits they provide to clients above the vehicle, in this case, the events that they use to do so. And finally, we talk about how the future of the event industry will inevitably be more tech integrated. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Event Manager Podcast and you consider subscribing and even leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Event Manager Podcast. On this episode, I'm delighted to have Kim Meyer as our guest here uh, with us today. Kim, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're in London, I believe, or somewhere near London? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very near London. Okay, and I'm based in Denmark, so we're actually uh, two Europeans talking, <laughs> and uh, they don't know where the listeners or listeners are listening to, but it's always interesting. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, it's it's really interesting. I've been following your work for a little while. We've only known each other for a few years, maybe, but I've been following your work and I see lots of interesting content around experience design and we have the experience design summit coming up. So hopefully we will be joining us for that. And yeah, it should be a too. fun experience. But for people that don't know you, Kim, um, can you tell us a little bit about your story uh, in, a, in a succinct way and I guess what excites you about this, this crazy industry? Yeah, okay. So... Um... Well, I started out in sort of um, marketing, um, and uh, <clears throat> and part of that marketing was in developing or designing event experiences. You know, back in the day, um, primarily in my early years, was focused on the tech industry um, and the growth of the tech industry. At one point uh, in my career, I actually ran a large U.S. trade show called Comdex. It actually took place in uh, twenty-two countries uh, around the world under license. So it was um, a pretty uh, significant and, and pretty large event. Um, and from there, went into the agency world, um, really focused on, you know, it, it, with the Comdex experience, really focused on reinventing or trying to reinvent the Comdex approach from one which was very traditional trade show focused to one which was more community and commerce based. And so from there... Um, Can you expand on, on that a little well, bit? That, that, I'm yeah. kind of curious. What do you mean by 20 events happening at the same time? Uh, not happening at the same time, uh, happening in 20 different locations around the world. Uh, okay. For example, in, in, in Switzerland, there was uh, Comdex Orbit. Uh, there okay. was Comdex Tokyo. Um, there was Comdex in Greece. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Comdex in Japan, Comdex China. You know, so rather than having one, only one yeah. massive event, you had lots of smaller events, but still had one big event. Yeah. And typically, and what, and and the way kind of that happened was that the Comdex brand was quite quite significant in the U.S. Uh, it happened twice a year in the U.S. Um, and also in Canada. But um, it, it you know a lot of it, the exhibitors and a lot of the attendees were international, and so it was a natural uh, extension to reach out into those markets directly. And um, you know where there were tech large tech events in a in a local uh, country like in Korea or wherever. You know, we often partnered under license with those large tech events and created a Comdex branded event. Um, and so sponsors then were able to buy, you know, sort of international uh, sponsorship opportunities and those sorts of things. And, and even then, even we're going back quite a few years now, uh, even then, um, you know, we're going back 20 years or more, um, even then focused on online uh, promotional opportunities and those kinds of things. So there was, you know, there was a lot of, uh, of, of that kind of work. But a lot of it took really understanding, you know, building a real strategy around the event. Um, you know, up until then, the strategy was really focused on exhibitor sales. I mean, that was the primary <laughs> driver, you know, which I think is true of most um, large trade shows. Uh, instead, and, and do you think thinking more about the in, community? In part, so in part, that move to the smaller events was to create a better user experience for the people that were in those communities. Yeah, and expand expand the reach of you know sort of some of these global um, uh, tech companies, 
you know, who were looking to build market opportunities in Asia and in, in and Asian companies in Europe and in Africa and in, in Middle East and so forth. So it was um, about opening up market opportunities for international players, for global players. I mean, that nice. was really part, part of the reason for that kind of branding. Um, and where and did it was you go kind from of there? A brand they recognized, you know, because they had participated in it. Uh, and so, and, and believed in the quality of it. And, and so that was kind of part of how the, how the brand expanded. And my role there as, you know, as sort of president of Comdex was really the strategy of how to take that brand, um, which had existed for quite a number of years, uh, and translate it into more of a, um, more of a, a, a more of a community-based brand where um, it was more focused on um, understanding the audience, understanding audience needs, you know, building specialized programming, um, moving online, all those kinds of things that we were doing at the time. And so a lot of that work that I did naturally translated into agency, what agencies were doing at the time. And I ended up going to George B. Johnson. I spent 10 years there as the managing director of Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa, um, growing that business. Um, and from there, uh, to um, I left to go to Freeman, uh, which is another large uh, U.S., well, I, they would call themselves global, but you know, primarily U.S. organization. Um, I launched... Uh, their their agency group here in Europe um, called um, Freeman XP, um, and did that for a number of years. And then um, from there, uh, ended up at MCI, helping MCI develop a new agency format um, for how they engaged uh, not just their association clients, but also their um, also their growing corporate uh, portfolio. And that was you know about how to really uh, look at using um, more multi-channel um strategies for building you know less focused on the specific logistics of the event and more on the overall customer experience and and uh and customer content experience and so i did that so that's i don't know that we're talking here i don't know 30 years <laughs> of working around the events business so um you know i've been around for a while um in 2020 i left mci and started uh, experience designed um partnered with a couple of colleagues of mine who uh, I've worked with over the years, a creative, uh, creative director uh, who's you know pretty well known in the business and a strategy director who actually lives in Denmark. Um, uh, and uh, the three of us sort of set up uh, an approach to helping at the time, <clears throat> we found there were agencies and even, uh, even clients, uh, you know, brands who were trying to reimagine how to do events and reimagine how to create more engaging experiences for their audiences to achieve their goals. Um, you know, up until, well, I think in, in many ways, you know, the, the events business had become a broadcast business. I mean, people measured success by how many people came uh, to the event versus what the overall engagement was and what the impact was. Um, and up until just recently, to be honest, there was data was very scarce and very thin on the ground. And most event organizers didn't really use data very much, even if they collected it. So the new sort of approach that we've been taking is what we call a more human-centered approach, which is to say, who is the audience? And let's really understand who they are, um, not just their title and job description, but who they are. Who, are they risk takers? Are they, are they people who are more conservative? You know, what is the nature of your audiences that you're attracting? And then what do they need? What you know? What what do what what do they find desirable? But more importantly, is you know how can you uh, engage them and encourage them uh, to see things your way? I mean, that was essentially it's a marketing exercise, and in the end, marketing is a guest in the house of sales, right? So the whole idea here is um, build experiences that encourage people to think in certain ways, and that means really understanding the people and drilling deep into that, building personas, understanding customer journey design, all that sort of stuff, which is what we do essentially uh, in helping agencies do that. Is it fair to say that your career is all about reimagining business strategy, but that you're <laughs> yeah. doing that through understanding people deeply? Yeah, I think that is the sort of, that is the primary characteristic of my entire career really has been about um, reinventing, reimagining uh, how things work. In fact, what's really interesting is someone just recently sent me an article, um, which is on my website, actually, uh, which I wrote uh, in 2010 
about hybrid events, <laughs> which was very interesting that we were talking about hybrid events in 2010 and only recently they've become something that people uh, recognize. And of course, because you know, it's always amazed me that people are constantly changing and adopting technology. I mean, we, we live in this sort of on live part online part live world and yet events uh, just really haven't kept pace with that they mm -hmm. uh in fact they're still very much using a sage on stage model of content which is a couple of, i don't know a thousand years old if not more and we we still think that that's uh the way to do it i think um it's clear that you know if you really let your mind uh expand around the idea of how to engage audiences and what motivates them even if you just walked in their own shoes with that kind of empathy you would find that most events are really damn boring. It, it's funny, actually, because I have was also uh, participated and, you know, kind of helped to plan in some small ways, uh, a few hybrid events between maybe 2010 and 2012, 13. And do, do you think it was the technology that, I guess, sprouted at that point and made them possible, but then there wasn't a need like a pandemic to for hybrid events, and that's why they kind of weren't top of mind for for the last few years yeah i think it's a combination of where the technology was and the state of technology at the time and i think it was also a case of where we were as consumers at the time and and um you know how how in, engaged we are today with technology and how we uh live in a very different way and that really is you know i mean it's recent isn't it it's in the last 10 15 maximum 20 years that technology curve is, you know, has gone the way it's gone. I mean, um, so I, I think it's that. I also think, you know, uh, the industry moves really slowly, just like most larger organizations, you know, event organizers in particular, or in my case that, that I've been dealing with, you know, it's hard to change. They have a financial model that really works for them. And the way to drive profitability is to do exactly what they have been doing, just do it more efficiently. Um, you know, whenever you try to experiment or do something um, unknown or risky, you know, it, it, it can be costly. And so, you know, the reality of it is, and it may not work. Uh, and, you know, one of the words that I think only the events industry uses, um, you know, maybe they use it in culinary arts, but they, is this word flawless, you know, flawless execution. It's, you know, it's become sort of a mantra, which means that if you're an event planner, um, caution is your, you know, your key word. You, you want to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Um, so experimenting is usually not high on your on your agenda, um, which keeps you in a stasis where you don't where the 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 industry doesn't really move forward in a way that it could. Um, I mean, much of the technology that's been around for the last couple of years, you know, I've attended live events and it's been there, um, but it's had to sponsor itself to be there, and it's been in the background. It hasn't been in the foreground, and I think we're starting to see that change, and I think that's really positive. So you. I mean, I, I assume you think it's it's worthwhile taking these risks, but how do you put that into a business proposal? You know, how do you go yeah. to a to a C suite and say, "Look, we need to take these these risks," and they're going, th th "There's too much risk." How do you balance that out? Yeah, it's a tricky one. You know, it's um, it, it, because I think there's lots of history uh, out there now where we know companies that have. Um, you know, their business has become obsolete or, you know, um, been disrupted uh, by technology. We're seeing it in the energy field. We're seeing it in the automotive industry. You know, we're seeing it in the media world. Um, you know, uh, you know, we have the examples of Kodak and, you know, and uh, video stores. And, you know, there are lots of examples here where, um, where, tech, where, you know, again, they played, a, those businesses played a role at a certain time and place, um, but, but didn't. I mean, those examples are classic and, and, you know, a lot of people yep. quote the Kodak example and they lots do. of other ones, but do you think that there are also a lot of companies that did something innovative, failed, disappeared, and nobody's ever heard about it and that were picking on the classic examples to make a point, but you know what I mean? Like the, the, it, it's like that, that kind of fallacy of like, oh, we only see the ones that we know, right? Yeah. Well, I don't think it needs to even, you know, you're right. And I, I think it may be even unfair to use the Kodak example, but I would say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Years ago, um, when I was uh, working with IDG, International Data Group, um, which is a publisher, was a publisher when I was there. Um, and uh, it was run by a guy by the name of Patrick McGovern. 
Uh, he was like in the Forbes Fortune 400, you know, richest guys. He had this big publishing. It's computer world, info world, PC world, computer Le Monde Informatique, uh, computer Volca, PC Velt, you know, it was a huge uh, publishing company. Anyway, I got an opportunity to travel um, with Pat uh, down to New York City um, to, to an event, which was um, called the Seabold Seminars. And it was years ago, and it was back when online publishing was just, you know, taking off. It was just starting. And Seabold Seminars was about online publishing. It was the, the subject matter. And we were there, and Pat was walking around. He was keynoting. And before his keynote, he was walking around the audience and, um, uh, you know, around the exhibition area. And people were coming up to him and talking to him and saying, Pat, don't worry, don't worry, you know, uh, this this whole online publishing thing is never going to take off, you know, I mean, who wants to read in a small little computer screen, nobody's going to want to do that, they're going to, you know, they're going to want the publication. So um, it's funny, then Pat got up on stage, and he said, you know, um, I've had a lot of uh, colleagues come up to me today to try to reassure me, don't worry, um, I don't have to, you know, have to worry about online publishing uh, uh, disrupting my my print publishing business, and he said, "But you know, I could be honest with you. It really made me nervous because I'm old enough to remember when sort of TV first emerged, and everybody in radio was saying, you know, don't worry, uh, TV is never going to, you know, take off. Um, who wants to watch a person reading the news um, on television?" And he said, "So you know, that made me really, really nervous. And of course, we know where TV is today and the role that TV plays in our lives." I think the same kind of scenario is true now if when we say, look, the only way that people can meet, engage, network, learn, entertain themselves, shop is live. <laughs> it's just not true. The reality of it is that we have moved on. That's not to say we don't want to be live. That's not to say that live won't still exist, just like radio still exists. But it means the pendulum is sort of swinging a little bit to an area where um, we may not be as comfortable, we may not be as knowledgeable, we may not have the kinds of experience, but there's no kind of turning it back. So just like TV, you know, we're kind of have to gonna figure it out. And I think that's kind of where we are now in the events world is that we're just gonna have to figure this online um, experience thing out. Um, because again, as I said, people shop, learn, they get treated for medical uh, issues. They drive with a sat nav. They we live in an, a, a world which is a hybrid world, um, and so the concept of hybrid event makes total sense to me. And all those people who don't want to call it a hybrid event, I'm okay with that. I'm fine. Call it whatever you want, but it will be a hybrid event. And I've heard people say, "Well, why will people want to go online to find content if they're at a live event?" Well, because they will. <laughs> Because <laughs> they will, because they'll hear somebody say something and immediately they'll want to look up more information about it and they'll be online. Now, you can either be the steward and facilitator and, and, um, and you know, and providing that content link and that ability to find out more, or you cannot be. It depends on how you, you want to engage with that audience and how comprehensive you want to be in terms of your relationship. Yeah, uh, I think I think you're, you're right. Um, I have a I, I, I do some speaking on on social media, or I did, and one of my kind of almost viral tweets that I've ever had in my career uh, was actually I was at a, a big MPI conference, and the speaker on stage. I'd done some research on him, and he mentioned this. I think it was the honeycomb of innovation, and uh, and I kind of did a very quick tweet uh, on with a link to the blog post that he created on this particular right. topic. And you have, you know, uh, what I call like a dark room of people watching the speaker. Uh, this is at a time when Twitter was was relatively was working pretty well, and you just had probably a few hundred people click on that link and go like, "Oh, this is really interesting." You're kind of supporting the the, the speaker and what the speaker is saying. So I'm totally with you on on that kind of uh, area. Yeah. Well, and it's it and it happens in all parts of our lives. You know, I can be watching TV with my, you know, with my kids. And just wonder to myself, who is that actor anyway? And the next thing I know, I know the actor's name, where they grew up, who they're married to, what other films they've done. It takes five seconds. Now that you can you can laugh at that and say that's not really a hybrid experience, but in fact it is. You know, the reality of it is that we are engaged in that experience at two different dimensions and two different levels, and it enhances the experience. Now I know a lot more about that actor than I did five seconds ago, 
changes my experience. So I think, you know, that, that, you know, I don't, I think we, you know, the thing that really worries me is that, you know, the Indians, the, the industry, you know, um, uh, trying so hard to sort of resist change um, that it's going to miss out on tremendous opportunities. And, you know, wow, just imagine what we can do now with the technology that's out there and with the capabilities that we have and with the, 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 the ability of our audiences to take advantage of that. I mean, it's, it's, it, these are good days for our industry um, if we want to embrace the future. So um, you do a lot of speaking online and uh, of course on stage as well, but um, I know that I do some speaking as well in virtual events and there are certain challenges around that. And then you've written about this. Um, what's your what's your take on virtual speaking and, and, and how can we make it better? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think, uh, first of all, I'm a big fan of, uh, of virtual experiences because uh, I think they, um, they have, there are a lot of benefits. One is that they have much better, much greater reach and can reach people uh, who don't travel or can't afford to travel or are disabled or whatever. I just think the accessibility of virtual experiences is a fantastic thing. Um, there's no question about that. And I also think from an environmental and sustainability perspective, you know, it just really does make sense. And, and no matter how uh, much we talk about, you know, greening of events and all that sort of stuff, um, you just can't argue with the facts that they do contribute uh, pretty substantially. Um, and, you know, in some ways too, virtual experiences allow you to use media in more engaging and entertaining ways. Are we there yet? <laughs> I don't think so. And there lies the problem, is that I think when you virtual experiences need to be good experiences for people on both ends of the, if you were, uh, line. And that is, you know, for example, speakers today don't always have that great of an experience because they tend to be talking into space. You know, they can't see anybody uh, on many of these platforms. Uh, they don't get immediate feedback. Uh, you know, they don't know if people are uh, laughing, crying, or, you know, throwing things at their screen. You know, there's just, there's no sort of uh, relationship. And I think that's a, that's a challenge. And, and, and it, it, because I think the quality of, of content um, in some ways requires that kind of, uh, that kind of interaction. Um, you know, just talking, into space is really uncomfortable for a speaker, um, but also um, not very motivating in terms of getting them excited about their subject and, and that sort of thing. So I think it's an area that we have to work on. As I was saying to you, I did just write a blog, uh, which is on my website, uh, which is called, um, you know, the uh, virtual uh, speaker, uh, the virtual event speakers lament, uh, where I did okay. speak at an event, and I could see okay. a blur, uh, basically a a, a, a time delayed picture of me, <laughs> which was very yeah. awkward, and a slide. I didn't know how many people were on the call. It could have been two, could have been 2,000. Who knew? Um, no yeah. feedback, no chat bar, nothing. And then what it was, I just kept talking until finally someone came on and said, Thank you very much. It's over. Um, <laughs> that was not I've a had great experience. Similar experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's just and not I a think great experience. I have the same complaints in many ways. And and it's made me think about how important feedback is uh, in social circumstances. And when it comes to virtual speaking, feedback can be, like you mentioned, the chat. It can be even just a number of how many people are viewing, you know, how many people are online. Uh, it can be people's faces, which is great. It can be emojis. It can be lots of different things. It can be questions coming through. But any sense of feedback um, I think is really important to us as humans. We often talk about networking in person really being the only way. I think a lot of that is because you can read people's reactions. If you talk yeah. about your company or project that you're doing and you can see that people aren't interested, you probably quickly change topic or talk about it in a different way or find another way to, to talk about things. Whilst if you're just if you're getting no feedback, you'll continue with your pitch. And if people are checking their emails, you have no idea of knowing that. You have right? no idea. Yeah, people have checked out or not. I, you know, and again, I've you know I've done presentations where uh, in on Zoom calls and on other platforms where you can see people's faces and you can see them reacting, and 
that, you know, I think, I think that's really positive. You know, I think a lot of it comes down to this idea that, you know, some of the best presentations that we hear, at least for me, um, when I hear presentations that really excite me that I'm really interested in, they're usually story-based. They're usually telling a story uh, in some way. And I think we know that storytelling is performative. You know, the reality of it is that telling a good story uh, has an audience ooing and aahing and being frightened and being excited. And, you know, so that that sort of performative aspect of speaking online, um, you know, needs to improve, I think, in order to improve the quality of the performances. And speaking is a performance when in, at the end of the day. You know, you create a narrative arc, you you know, you tell a tell a story so everyone likes you, you take them to a place where they're scared to death, and then you show them the solution and everybody is uh, delighted. I think being able to do that um, without any kind of feedback at all is harder and is really hard to do. So, I, I mean, I think, um, and I don't think it's impossible. The technology can provide that feedback and we can see people on screen and we've seen that happen. I mean, the, the, the um, Tony Robbins, uh, you know, presentations where he, he's had virtual screens of, you know, a thousand attendees and he can call them out by name and he sees them on the wall. I mean, we know how to do it. Um, so I think, um, you know, th that's going to be an important development over time as we start to really yeah. improve virtual events. Now, have you said that all of that, because I said I'm a big fan of virtual events, we are still in early days. And so we tend to put up with a lot that's not great right now, but we won't forever. Um, yeah. And so these improvements will have to come. And do you think, I mean, I don't, I was thinking about who, who's to blame for this. I, I don't know if necessarily who's to blame is the right angle to take, but do you feel like it's the, the AV companies that are not aware of the stress they're causing or the, the kind of bad experience they're causing the speakers? Or is it the organizers that just feel like, again, not no risk taking this will make the speaker look good because the system works. So I'm just kind of get it, get it done like this. Where do you think the, 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 you know, where do you think we can kind of crack the code and change this? Yeah, I think it is a little bit of a, a little bit of um, technology over, over content um, quality in the sense that, um, you know, the events industry is, as I pointed out before, you know, very logistics oriented. It is very much about, how to do something and how to get it done uh, as flawlessly as possible. Um, and is had traditionally been less focused on what's the quality of the experience. And, you know, I think that, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many keynotes I've been to where, you know, you, you're ushered into a dark room where they're herding you like cattle with roped off, you know, seats and you can't sit in this row. You have to go sit in that row. Well, why? You know, anyway, but they do this and you're sitting down and you're in seats so close together so that they could fit everybody into this keynote session that you have to hold your bag on your lap because you're, you know, you're so jammed in and music's blaring and, you know, the, the keynote speaker comes down, it's usually sub executive and they blab on basically selling uh, because that's, you know, what they're there to do essentially for a really long time, usually running over the time. Uh, and then, you know, everybody has to hustle out. Now, you know, this is sort of, we had the load in, now we have the load out. Uh, so get everybody out of there as fast as you can. Uh, get the past the watered down coffee stations as quickly as possible because the keynoter ran over because she could. Uh, and then get them into breakout rooms with no windows in the dark with PowerPoint presentations with technical speakers who really aren't very good speakers. You know, it's the nature of how we've created these kinds of things, which again, logistics rules over content uh, in a way which has, you know, generally not been a friend to content. And I think when we start thinking about people and we start, you know, looking more human centric about how do you engage people, what do they find entertaining, what do they find scary, what do they find, all these kinds of really starting to understand people, we're going to start thinking about experiences in a different way. And then we're going to start to say, you know what, this, even though it's possible, feasible, and possibly even flawless, it doesn't work because the experience is not what we need in order to achieve what we want to achieve with this particular profile. And that's the direction I think we're going in. That's really interesting. It, 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 I mean, I kind of feel like it's logistics driven because you want to get the maximum amount of people 
to Watching. attend an event at the same time, right? And then if you need to move those people around, it's, it's not easy to move a large amount of people. So you kind of have these restrictions. Yeah. And when you have that amount of people, you can't, there's not a lot of options, right? You can't just <laughs> let people roam free for like 20 minutes because it's nice. It's like, oh, wait, now nobody's going to go to the breakouts, right? And then you kind of lose people or something like that. Yeah. So it does feel like you're restricted by those kind of financial constraints. But if you measure the effectiveness on people, how much people actually learn or enjoy or whatever is the sort of main objective, and that's not really being achieved, then you probably have a good case for saying, great that we can do this, but it's right. not achieving the objectives it's that you achieving, want. Right. right? Exactly. And I, and I think we are starting to see, you know, we're borrowing from our colleagues in the uh, TV broadcasting business, and we're starting to learn you know, how to set up staging and uh, how to use uh, studio audiences and, you know, um, how, to, how to, you know, uh, you know, you'll notice, for example, in virtual events, content sessions are a lot shorter uh, than they were in live events. And they were too long in live events. <laughs> you know, our attention span probably is only 20 minutes, as TED Talks has been telling us for the last, you know, 15 years. So I, I think, you know, there are some things we're learning as we go along and developing virtual experiences that content needs to be shorter, it needs, the production qualities need to be higher, you know, there needs to be some sort of audience feedback, whether it's a limited number of virtual uh, attendees uh, for feedback purposes, or, you know, like a studio audience, or however we do it, um, you know, we're, we're, we're grappling and learning as we go about how to do this. So I don't think that we're stuck by any means into this sort of where we are today, where these experiences are not that great. Um, you know, we're all just learning. And I think we have an opportunity to really improve it. Um, and we're going to have to, because again, uh, as I said, you know, like, you know, for example, I live in England and my, a lot of my family live in the US. Um, and I've basically seen more of my family in the last year and a half uh, than I have in the last 10. Uh, <laughs> on Zoom virtually. Your... Yeah. Yeah. Virtually, you know, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it, it, you know, inside their houses and, uh, their new dog. And, you know, I mean, you know, things that I, you know, haven't visited my sister in Florida in, in years, um, you know, to see her house and what she's doing. And, you know, so it's powerful. Um, it's a powerful medium that, uh, you know, is, is, is obviously going to become an increasingly important part of how we uh, engage and communicate with people. Um, yeah. And it'll improve in time, I'm sure. But right now, it's, it's pretty tough sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the work that that you're doing. And I know that a lot of your work is this concept that we're already talking about a little bit of, of reimagining yeah. businesses, reimagining future opportunities. Um, yeah. Start wherever you want to start. But I'm really curious about this whole concept of, of reimagining what's possible. Yeah. So, you know, it's, um, it, it's an interesting uh, idea. But, you know, uh, Buckminster Fuller, you know, one of the uh, engineering and philosophers of the past has said, you know, um, we're not meant to be the victims of the future, we're meant to be its architects. And I think there's something to that, you know, um, you know, the events industry, you know, really took it, took it, uh, a, you know, a tough shot with the COVID situation. Um, and a lot of people were really unprepared for change and really unprepared for imagining how they might do things in a different way. And that was rough. Um, and it was rough on our business models and it was rough on, you know, um, people um, who had a certain skill set, um, which at the time, you know, and for the time wasn't required. Um, and so, you know, it, it was it was really, really tough. But the reality of it is we do have an opportunity uh, to imagine and to design um, a better and you know, a future for our industry and for what we do. Part of that requires focusing on the value of what we do, not what we do. You know, it's the classic marketing myopia. You know, if you focus on your product, uh, it can become obsolete. If you focus on the value that your product provides, that evolves and you have an opportunity to evolve and change. And the classic example uh, used in the book, market, the article Marketing Myopia is the American railroads. They fought so hard to stay in the railroad business, they didn't realize they were in transportation. And I think that's the same for the events industry. You fight so hard to keep doing events the way you've always done them. You don't realize you're in the audience engagement business. You're in the community building business. You know, you're in the content education and learning business. You're in a, those businesses are those value propositions that events 
in theory provided still are important and are still valuable and it may require a different approach. And that's the challenge and the opportunity for our industry. So what I really, what, what we're trying to do with a lot of our clients now is, is you know, just say, look, let's just, let's forget that you know how to do events. Let's just put it all down and, you know, let, let, let's use a beginner's mind here and just say, let's talk about audiences and what they need. Let's talk about communities of people and what they need um, and figure out all the possible ways that we might satisfy that proposition. Not how do we force fit events to satisfy that proposition, but what other ways and what are the, the, the whole scale of ways that we might imagine. Could we imagine a future where people engaged in this way, where people met in this way, where people networked in this way, where people shopped in this way, that kinds of future? What would it look like? What would this positive future look like? And then where are we now? And how do we re-engineer and design deliberately, consciously, how to get to that future proposition? And it's kind of empowering because it, it, it may not be you know, major transformation overnight, but it gives you the confidence that you can take some steps in a direction that you can visualize as a possible reinvention of the future. So that's kind of the work that we've been doing, a lot of workshop work. Um, I've been writing a lot of articles and speaking a lot with com com companies about what the mindset is, what kind of mindset you require to embrace the fact that change is inevitable. You know, you just, it, it is inevitable. You know, I mean, there's no way to avoid that. Two is that you can be a victim of change um, or you can be an architect of the future. And then three, with the right mindset and the right kinds of design tools, you can actually um, you can actually create that future for your business, um, and so that's kind of the work that we've been doing. That sounds really interesting, and I'm I'm sure you get a lot of pushback, or or you know, it's not an easy task to do this. And what do you kind of, how do you work with people to to overcome those challenges and overcome those you know maybe limited budgets or not necessarily yeah. a clear vision for their future? Could you go into a little bit of how you get people started on this process? Well, you know, again, to your point, we were talking earlier about the whole idea that COVID was a real accelerator of, uh, in some ways of, you know, the, the change in our industry. And, and, you know, there's something to that. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we find is that lots of agencies and organizations, even, even client organizations, you know, um, they're kind of worried about their, their future. Um, they're worried about whether their skill set is going to be a suitable skill set for a changed future. Do they know enough about technology? Do they know psych, you know, end user psych, you know, customer psychology? Are they, you know, is this the stuff they know how to do? Or do they know how to move furniture around, manage catering, set up lighting, you know, the production side of things, which by the way is still really important, not suggesting it's not, but that the two things now uh, almost have equal weight. And so I think there's a willingness. Uh, to learn or at least be exposed to what the possible opportunities for the future are as a way of overcoming the fear of unknown um, of what's going to happen uh, in the future. So yes, there's still, no one wants to sort of kumbaya and fall into your arms or anything, you know, that, that's not happening. But I think most organizations realize that they sort of have to begin uh, to be a little more deliberate about where they're headed. Um, and uh, you know, it's and it's really interesting that some of the some of the agencies I've worked with, they were so busy, they were so successful, they were making so much money that it was kind of like we don't need to worry about the future. We just need to keep busy. We don't have enough staff. We're busy and we're running our hairs on fire, uh, so we're not planning for our future. And I think maybe this gave us a little opportunity in a sense. It's a little break where we could say, you know what, we can't control. Uh, things necessarily. We don't have control over the environment. We don't have control over illnesses. We don't have control over uh, changes in that technology. Um, we, and we need to be mindful of that. And we need to, as part of a successful business, have a contingency contingency to what the future might look like and how we're moving in that in the right direction. So I think you are getting more acceptance. Interesting. Um, do you have a clear vision of, of what the future looks like? for the industry uh well i think we're moving where i well there are lots of scenarios out there about the future obviously 
but I think we are, you know, the technology alone around us today and its capabilities, we are moving to, I think, in a, a world where we do live in a much more live and online world, um, you know, much more in technology enhanced lifestyle. Um, you know, that's from having, you know, toothbrushes that tell you when you have, you know, a cavity or you, you have too much plaque um, to the, the soap, the, the Alexa soap dispenser now that plays a song so you know how long to wash your hands to uh, sat nav um, where you don't actually ever need to look at a map and you can feel quite confident to get wherever you're going to the way we consume um, content in, you know, for example, gaming and online gaming today and uh, the numbers of people that online gaming reaches and the engagement levels that it consumes. Um, the changes in how we shop and the end of the sort of retail uh, world and retailers becoming more experience centers rather than stockists, you know, because it makes more sense to have that online. There's just so many fundamental changes that are occurring uh, in how we live that it's only natural that the world of events uh, will need to change and we'll need to embrace, you know, some of those changes and become, um, you know, more tech integrated in terms of how it provides experiences and how it builds communities and how it um, you know, distributes content. So I think you know, the future definitely looks more like that. Now, having said that, um, that's at the very front of the sort of bus, if you will. You know, there's generations of people coming, coming up in the world who don't have access to technology in quite the way that, that they should. Um, and we need to be cognizant of that too. And, we need to be making sure that when we are designing experiences, we're thinking about accessibility and access, and um, we're thinking about sustainability, and you know we're thinking about not just things that are desirable, but things that you know not things that just are desirable by our audiences, but things that are beneficial. Um, and you know there's a lot of talk in the industry now about purpose and all that sort of thing, but you know what a tremendous opportunity our industry has um, to help facilitate some of that purpose and. So I see a more purposeful, I see a more technology orientated, I see a more human uh, centric that is much more personal, um, um, more personality driven and less process uh, driven future. And you know, they're the kinds of things that I think most organizations um, need to, and many are building towards now. That sounds like a, a pretty promising future. And it, it sounds like we're, we're kind of I was going to say taking baby steps. We're not really taking baby steps. I think we're taking kind of enforced large steps uh, at the moment, but, yeah. but we're still kind of in early days. Kim. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, and this is one of the things that I've been saying recently in some of my writing is that, you know, there's debate out there is like, you know, where people saying, you know, hybrid, you know, doesn't mean anything. And, you know, they're just events or events and events have always been hybrid and, you know, all that kind of thing. You know, words matter. Um, they matter a lot. And how we talk about our future and how we talk about our industry and our ambitions for our future and for our industry are important um, because they not only are they motivational, but they're informative in terms of helping people realize that that imagining new ways of doing things um, makes sense. You know, having more diverse input makes sense. You know, like having young people tell you, I don't want to go to a trade show because it, it, it doesn't work for me is powerful, you know, when, you know, when we think about what the future is going to look like. So I think, you know, all of those kinds of using that empathy and that more human centric approach, you know, whether you call it design thinking or whatever you want to call it, um, I think will get us there. You know, it is a matter of just making the commitment uh, to embrace change uh, and, and to explore innovation. Um, and, and I think you can do that profitably. I don't think it needs to be something that businesses need to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think the reality of it is, is that you can make money being purposeful and, um, and, and innovating. And I think lots of companies have proven that. Great stuff, Kim. That's fascinating. And I think it's a very positive view of the future, which I think is, is, is needed. There's no point in thinking of the future as, as negative. Um, where can people find you if they want to find you, if they want to get in touch, what's the best way to do that? Well, um, so my email is, uh, I could give you my email. It's just, it's just Kim, K I M at X designed .com. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Pretty simple. And, and that's the URL uh, for your website. website. The website is X 
perfect xdesign.com excellent yeah and i'm going to ask you one last question which is something we're asking all our guests and i hope i don't put you on the spot too much which is we'd love to have a recommendation from you for the for a person to have on the podcast in the future so um, anybody come to mind that you think we should uh, interview well i think um someone who is was very influential to in me um, in my thinking, and who is speaks often, his name is Franz Johansson, yep. um, and he wrote the Medici, uh, yep. um, and the whole idea of diverse uh, input to 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 design is really really important in his world. Um, so the whole idea of the Medici effect, two ideas that don't look like they have anything to do with one another, come together to create a third. Um, is you know pretty central to his consulting business, but I think pretty inspirational too in terms of uh, some of the tools that we're using uh, in helping agencies and and clients um, start to to think about you know if all of you have all worked together for the last ten years, don't you think we should bring some some other people in here <laughs> have some different perspectives? You know, um, you know because you're you know two of you are afraid to ever say anything and two of you say everything and. You know, so building that kind of more diverse environment of uh, an open environment of uh, discourse and, um, and and of ideation is something that he has really stood for all of his career, and I think has worked with some big corporations and made some huge uh, progress in those corporations. So I'd love to hear him speak on your podcast. That's a great recommendation. Thank you very much for that. We'll 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 see what we can do. We'll, we'll get you to put us in touch with him so we can. Make yeah, I can happen. do that. So let me know. <laughs> Kim, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for being on the podcast with us today. Wish you lots of success and uh, look forward to seeing more of your writing and more of your work and hopefully seeing you in person very soon. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager Podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmb.com.